You did it on yes. Hello, it's uh, David again, and um, let's see. Here I am with Jim and Debbie Yunkin, my fellow uh, born and raised Washingtonians, and uh, former uh, former uh, hippies hippies <laughs> that that left the covenant path to uh, participate in. Um, the so-called counterculture, but they had something solid to return to when uh, it's, the scripture says there's pleasure in sin for a season. <laughs> when the pleasure in sin for a season wore off, they got, they returned to the covenant path and got, got, uh, you, you know, just embarked. Now, how many children and grandchildren do you have at this point? Um, we Two have 27 grandchildren. We have 27 grandchildren. One great. We have one great grandson. And 11 children, is it? We have 11 children, yes. 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 You can't skip the children to the grandchildren. You, you, you got to say how many children, then how many grandchildren. And one great-grandchild, did you say? Right. That's wonderful. Now, yeah. Jim, I need to coach Jim here a little bit on his smile because, see, <laughs> you can't, when you have a Fu Manchu that does this, even if you're kind of half smiling, you look like you're still frowning. So he has to be a bit a bit aggressive with his smile. Or if I raise my eyebrows, it looks like I'm smiling. Actually, when you raise your eyebrows, it looks like you raised your eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, now, now that I'm done picking on Jim, let, let's return to the business at hand, which is we, we're telling... Video, what is this mini series we're doing? What's it called? I forget. It's who is, who is this is, the real who is, really is. Yeah. David Alexander? This, this latter, who is Latter day Saint convert David Alexander? Really, who is really? he? There you, really? there you go. Who is he? Really, we want to like peel back the veneer and and see who he is really. And so, that's this is a since it's a 50 year story, as we said in our last videos, it has to be an an epic mini series. We don't even know, I can't tell you how many parts it's gonna take to tell the story. <laughs> well, if you don't but, get going, it'll be more than a couple. <laughs> now don't don't be impatient. Don't be impatient. <laughs> Rome wasn't built in a day. We 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 have to re be relaxed about this. The Holy Ghost is never in a hurry, uh, or something. That was something I noticed. We probably influenced you wrongly because we didn't. You didn't pray or sing in the last one. <laughs> well, that's true. That's true. I mean, how can I tell my story without praying or singing? Sorry about that, Heavenly Father. We just come before Thee in the name of Thy beloved Son Jesus, and we just ask by the power of Your Holy Ghost that You would help me to tell this story. And um, I don't want to get heavy about it because this is my past and forgetting what lies behind and reaching forth to what lies ahead. I'm pressing towards the mark of the upward call. And I know of a certainty, as it says in Romans 8, 28, that our Heavenly Father is working all of these things, all of these, just all of my folly and stupid mistakes and different things that I did or failed to do, that you're working it all for the good. My my wandering around in the desert for 47 years, looking for the city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. You're taking all of, you're restoring the years that the locust is eaten, and you're going to bring great glory and good out of all of my failures and frustrations. And for that, I just thank and praise you, Heavenly Father. And we just ask you, just help us, Help Jim and Debbie uh, keep me on track and help me to stay on track and help us to move through this story of my life in a way that is edifying and encouraging to those who watch these videos. And we just ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, your beloved son, in the name of thy beloved son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Okay. Amen. Let's have a song. <clears throat> good where's my oh man don't tell me i don't have the pick you can't reach behind you like you usually do i know In i know car. here we go <clears throat> let's see
Blessed be God, even the Father of, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Comfort us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted of God. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Comfort us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted of God. With the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted of God. With the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted of God. Isn't that a beautiful... How many songs like that do you know? Well, I'm, I'm going to work my way through the Bible. And when I see the scripture, I'm like, oh, that's a song. That's a song. That's a song. That's a song. I, I'd say three or four hundred. Yeah. They're all in there. And they're not copyrighted. The the vast majority. Yeah. These songs aren't copyrighted. They're, they're just... Just some some Jesus person back in the day that you remember so well. Um, <laughs> they just they were inspired. They grabbed their guitar and they they just took took one or two verses out of the King James version and normally put a one four five chord progression to it. Maybe they threw in a minor a minor chord or something, uh, and uh, just you know. And I I just I just soaked all this stuff up like a big sponge. So Where did we end up yesterday? We you were in Iowa or Ohio or I don't know. I was we're... in Ohio. Yeah. And I had uh inspired by Harold Warner's example at the Door Christian Fellowship, which I should mention the Jesus movement, a huge part of my formation as a disciple of Jesus Christ was in this thing called the Jesus movement. And um there was an explosion of evangelism and people turning to Christ, especially young people who had horrible consciences from doing things that their parents never dreamed of doing. Right. 17, 18, 19. And these young people like me did them when I was 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. And, and then they ended up basically in despair, uh, normally 20 if if there's a 20 year old that's in despair that should be abnormal <laughs> because the world is their oyster man they got their whole life in front of them uh but, let me just uh, mention one thing real quick sure During a period of time uh 1968 1969 yeah all of these drugs lsd mescaline and a lot of these drugs were brand new i mean maybe mm -hmm. indians had them as you know in some of their ceremonies but these things were being passed around and nobody knew what they were going to do to you or anything yeah. I mean, but it's not like today where you have you know 50 different things that you can take that are bad for you but it was a new thing and it was experimental and and yeah. uh, you know it's it, true had a whole counter corner counter and i think it's worth saying yeah. that the, the the underlying spirit of that whole movement was very much loving and exactly caring for each other it started it out that it happen. started out that way as we've talked about before and and a lot of that was inspired by the beatles love is right. all you need gonna get by with a little help from my friends i don't care too much for money money can't buy me love right and uh th that went into the hearts of an entire generation and and then the whole the Beatles 
began experimenting with drugs. Lucy yeah. in the sky, <laughs> diamond. So it's no accident that was on the same album with, I get by with a little help from my friends. I'm, I get high with a little help from my friends. I'm going to try. Do you need anybody? I need somebody to love. I mean, this <laughs> this was all kind of a package deal. Yeah. But it ended up turning bad because of right. the hedonism and the individualism. L love and togetherness uh, don't work with hedonism and individualism because love isn't about self-indulgence. It's largely about self-sacrifice. Right. But in any case, all I wanted to say was out of that Jesus movement, Christianity can take anything and make more divisions. Non-Latter-day Saint Christianity is, in essence, uh, a division-producing machine. And uh, just some of the most of these things, these groups, I'm going to say, they're de every one of them, they're denominations that that were birthed through the Jesus movement. And um, I I touch base with or threw myself into most of these, if not all of them. And uh, they became denominations that had their start from hippies that got saved. <laughs> In, right. in evangelical christianity and then it ended up developing at first it was very informal you know coffee houses jesus people communal houses and then it it gradually got co-opted into more traditional denominationalism that was all divided and people building their own kingdoms in these things and the group i started i didn't mention this the other time and of course a lot of people say the the more traditional christians would say oh cult 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 uh, but what happened in the Jesus movement, one of the things that happened was people began reading the Bible with, I guess you could say, new eyes, not with eyes bound by the religious tradition of mainline Protestantism or mainline Pentecostalism, for that matter, mainline evangelicalism. There were certain aspects of that that were um, pretty set in stone. You know, the idea of cessationist thinking that... that uh, there weren't any apostles today. There weren't any prophets today. The gifts of the Spirit ceased with the death of the first apostles. You know, things like miracles and healings. That stuff was not supposed to... And, you know, the you course... Just read the Bible. Just have the Bible. Yeah, you have the Bible. And actually, this is the teaching of the cessationists. One of the last verses in the love chapter of 1 Corinthians 13 is when... It, it talks about all these gifts that they'll all be done away when that which is perfect is come that which is imperfect will be done away and they and the, they would say well the bible was the perfect thing that came so we don't need healings and miracles and mm -hmm. apostles and we don't need all that stuff because we have the bible so that this is like an extreme and entirely non-biblical understanding of uh the Bible of, of Scripture of Sola. Yeah, it's right. it's like it's 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 a misuse of the Bible because the Bible plainly teaches that Jesus Christ is the same today and yesterday, today, and forever, and that Heavenly Father set all those gifts in the church to to bring about the maturity of the church until it becomes a church worthy of Christ's return, which last time I checked hasn't happened yet. Now I say all this just to say, like this one Jesus people group I got involved with. Uh, Jim Durkin, he was a former Assemblies of God pastor, and he started this group uh, from Lighthouse Ranch in Eureka, California, like in the early 1970s. He start, started his own church, a deliverance temple. And uh, and at some point in the, in the 70s, uh, he decided that he saw, and see, this stuff is accurate. People started seeing all over the United States, what they call the fivefold ministry. If you if you read in Ephesians chapter four, it talks about how Jesus descended and then he ascended far above all things. And he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for works of service until we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the son of God and attain to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And, and uh, you know, if, you, if you're just a normal person that believes words mean what they say, and you read that, well, do the saints still need to be equipped for works of service? <laughs> well, of course. That's what you're looking for. 
and and so Jim Durkin, I, I I join this little gospel outreach group, and I'm in this. I move into this gospel outreach communal house, and they're entirely assemblies of God, and they're thinking except for this. Jim Durkin has decided the fivefold ministry needs to be restored on the earth, and so he's like, okay, I'm an apostle, and he thought he was an apostle because he was. Uh, sending different groups of these Christian hippies that got discipled at the Lice House Ranch, like he sent a group of them to my hometown of Olympia. And that's how I ran into these characters. And and they got me to give my life to Jesus without baptism. And then they dunked me and I got wet down in Capitol mm -hmm. Lake. But all I'm saying is that all I'm saying is that this this was outside the norm of evangelical Christianity. But this has been ongoing. And see, Latter-day right. Saints probably aren't aware of this, but these people thought they were doing some amazing new thing with amazing revelation from on high that there needed to be apostles and prophets. And of course, Joseph Smith beat him to the punch by 150 right. years. Right. Yeah. You know? He's like, you can't have the church without apostles and prophets. And Do you actually, think I should have, I should have, what's that? Do you think that there's any chance that they had encountered something about the church or they might have picked this up some of them might have picked this idea up from the latter-day saints it's entirely possible but i it's not necessary if you just read your bible with new eyes and don't explain away things that don't fit in with the doctrine of your de denomination all jim durkin had to do was read ephesians 4 or first corinthians 12 and and not explain it away based on the fact that the assemblies of God didn't believe that apostles were still supposed to be around. So he he didn't have to borrow that idea from the from the Latter Day Saints, but he might have because, of course, the Latter Day Saints that has been their distinctive for the hundred and fifty years until you got to the night until you got to nineteen seventy from eighteen twenty to nineteen seventy. So for 150 years, that was a distinctive. It stopped being a distinctive in the 1970s a little bit, but that's gradually increased. And I, I could have, I could have read you. Let, let me. Um, I, I think I need to find this. Hold on, just be patient with me. I want to see if I can find something here. Yeah, I, I was going to say that. Um... The Beatles, I actually saw the Beatles in 1966 in Seattle. I got it. That's my claim to fame when I was 16 years old. So um, I love the Beatles. In concert live, favorite, yeah. Yeah, in okay. concert. In this, yeah, and they're my favorite group. They're my go-to when I'm listening to music and uh, love them. Okay, here we go. Christianity Today. All right, this is from Christianity Today. A quiet revolution is taking place in American religion, says Brad Christensen and Richard Flory, authors of The Rise of Network Christianity, how independent leaders are changing the religious landscape. Largely behind the scenes, a group of mostly self-proclaimed apostles leading ministries from North Carolina to Southern California have attracted millions of followers with promises of direct access to God. Their movement, which Christensen and Flory call Independent Network Charismatic Christianity, has become one of the fastest growing faith groups in the United States. Apostles like Bill Johnson, Mike Bickle, Cindy Jacobs, Chuck Pierce, and Che On claim millions of followers. They're also aided by an army of fellow ministers who fall under their spiritual covering. Many of these apostles run mega churches, including Bethel Church in Reading, and it goes on and on and on. And and so when was that actually, article written? That's brand what's new. that? This is, is that from, a new article. This is an article in Christianity Today, and the date I think is sometime fairly recently. Uh August third no 2017 so this was seven years ago but this is a snowball that started rolling down the hill when i first gave my life to jesus in 1976 jim durkin like i'm an apostle in his town of eureka california all the other ministers were like freaked out you're not an apostle this is cultic you know they they held like 
meetings in town to try to decide what to do with Jim Durkin claiming to be an apostle. But this, this has continued since then and increased and increased where you can go online now and you can find books of all of the apostles, all of the self-proclaimed apostles in the United States and worldwide that are like, you know, there's hundreds, hundreds, there's thousands of them. And th their unique characteristic is they're all independent of one another. <laughs> they, they, because, do you know, it's like... They can't agree. It, it, well, they, they can't, they, their authority as apostles has to be exercised independently it is they they can't really be one with each other because they, they're building their own apostolic kingdoms and so they they all have this you know i'll scratch your you're an apostle i'll say you're an apostle if you say i'm an apostle isn't this great <laughs> we're all apostles now and we've got millions of followers and they they all tithe to us this is so great you know but in terms of what we have in the Church of Jesus Christ that I finally found, we've got apostolic and prophetic leaders, prophets, seers, and revelators that are completely one as the Father and the Son are one, as Jesus prayed in John 17 would be the only definitive proof of where the kingdom of God actually exists. And this is this is what I hope to find, but starting with Jim Durkin and continuing for the next fifty years, I'm I'm searching. I discarded Jim Durkin as an apostle when I went and visited the Vatican of Gospel Outreach in Eureka, California, and found out that as he he, he had had a career in real estate and he hadn't stopped his career in real estate, and all the disciples were like giving up everything to be, you know, under Jim Durkin's covering. But he was he was buying all these properties all over right. Eureka and renting them out to the disciples. Oh. <laughs> and I'm like, this man isn't an apostle. He's a Christian businessman. Yeah. And, and, you know, the, the people that he discipled that became like the leaders that he raised up from young men, they all became Christian businessmen without exception. They all became Christian businessmen. But in any case... All I'm saying is that I'm looking for real authority. And if you're looking for real apostles, you know what you're going to have to fight your way through? You're going to have to fight your way through an army of false apostles. Right. <laughs> I mean, like you can read in, in Revelation chapter 3, and it specifically says, you know, to the Ephesians, the, the angel of the church of Ephesus says, you know, you, I commend you, you've tested those who claim to be apostles and are not. This is one of the commendations. It's like, and Paul writes about this in his letters to the Corinthians. There were all these false apostles coming to him and and trying to pull the loyalty of the Corinthians away from Paul to themselves, okay? And, and you know, convincing people, so you, you say Paul's bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. Paul was not like this gifted orator, and 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 so you know pretty much all of these characters you know they, they run these mega churches they build the mega churches on the back of their gifted oratory and being able to move people's emotions and make them they think they're feeling the holy ghost you know they've got what they call glory bumps but it has nothing to do with the actual holy ghost which is humble and simple and submissive and it's like our leaders in the Church of Jesus Christ, they're actually humble. How can somebody as accomplished as President and gifted as President Nelson is be humble and submissive? Well, actually, it's normal because Jesus Christ was humble and submissive, which this is a radical thought, but do you know what that means? That means Heavenly Father is humble and submissive because Jesus Christ, it says, is the exact representation of the Father's being. He wasn't that way in opposition to how our Heavenly Father is. He was that way by embodying how our Father is. If but, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yeah, and he says, yeah. come to me, all you who are weary and find life burdensome. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek 
and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So in any in any case, out of the out of the Jesus movement, you had gospel outreach, gospel outreach. Mostly it fell apart, but there's six, a, a denomination of six gospel outreach reformational churches. That's one denomination. A group of jo gospel outreach disciples were sent down to Nicaragua when there was that huge earthquake back in the 1970s. And they started a Nicaraguan version of gospel outreach called the Verbo Churches, which is Spanish for word, the word churches. And Efrain Rios Mont, who was the president of Guatemala, became one of their disciples and attended their churches. And they were tremendously successful. And they, the Verbo Churches, which essentially was a Spanish version of gospel outreach, has spread. They've got thousands of churches down in South America and in cities where there's substantial Spanish-speaking populations. That's a second denominational. Well, let's get you out of Ohio. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Well, but anyway, it, well, it, this is important. No, I know this is important because my journey largely involved trying to find something solid in these denominational exactly. expressions that came out of the Jesus movement. So there's a method to my madness. So just okay. let me finish Go ahead. What I'm saying here. You had, uh, if, if anybody has seen this movie about the Jesus movement, what's it called? The Jesus Revolution? Uh -huh. That was Pastor Chuck Smith in mm -hmm. Costa Mesa, California, who left the Four Square Gospel Church to start his own denomination of Calvary Chapel. And those have spread out. There's, I don't know, probably at least a thousand Calvary Chapel churches spread around the world, but particularly in the United States. And then one of the pastors of one of the Calvary Chapel churches, a man by the name of, uh, oh gosh, in any case, the, the Vineyard Churches, John Wimber. John Wimber left the Calvary Chapel churches and started his own denomination called uh, the Vineyard Churches. And th there's probably a, between one and 2,000 Vineyard Churches scattered all over the place. And and then you had the, the Vine House uh, was a Jesus people house in Chattanooga, Tennessee that multiplied and they ended up with all these communal houses and starting these little restaurants called the Yellow Deli. And that was started by Gene Spriggs. All these, like Gene Spriggs, considered himself an apostle. Uh, and he ended up going up to uh, Vermont with his people and they continued to grow. They became the Northeast Kingdom Community Church the church in Island Pond. And then they started spreading and starting communities in a number of different places in the United States and Canada and around the world. And that's what, when they realized that they were supposed to gather Israel and restore the 12 tribes, they, they changed their name from the Northeast Kingdom Community Church to the 12 tribes communities. So that's an, a, a denominal, denominational expression that came out of the Jesus movement. Then, I'm just about done here, so please be patient. Then, this is another group that I got, got involved with. There was a, a group of, um, there was a group, uh, two fellows, uh, Larry Tomsack, who came from a Catholic background, and C.J. Mahaney started a huge Bible study in the Washington, D.C. area called TAG, Take and Give. And then they decided they were apostles, OK, <laughs> and they started started planting churches as apostles and raising up supposedly other apostles. And uh, that whole thing developed in they, they first of all, they called themselves the People of Destiny International. And then in time that they, they changed their name and they became Calvinist and they, they became the Sovereign Grace Church denomination. And, and there's many of the Sovereign Grace, Grace Churches scattered. Yeah, I didn't know that these guys were calling themselves apostles. That's a, something that oh, I did. Oh, yeah, totally, yeah. totally. And and this, this is why I brought all this up, because I am looking for a city that has foundations. I know Ephesians 2.19 says the true church has to be on the foundation of apostles and prophets, which Jesus right. Christ is the chief cornerstone. Yeah. I know that scripture sola does not work. Right. Everywhere I look, everything I'm experiencing is just division and confusion. This 
multi-thousand choice smorgasbord of faith and practice that you're Can just you take just a second and, and explain what scripture a sola is or whatever i've that's scripture what sola is the foundational teaching of evangelical charismatic and pentecostal christianity and much of protestant Martin even Luther. mainline protestantism which basically it's this thing martin luther came up with he rejected the idea that the tradition of the church had a authority over the scripture to interpret it that the teaching authority of the Roman Catholic Church had the God-given right to rightly divide the word and said that the scripture alone is to right. be the determiner of faith and practice. Well, that's but all you need is the Bible. All you need is the Bible. Right. But of course, they, they didn't believe it themselves because in actual practice, the Bible was interpreted through the prism of Luther's writings. And right. even crazy stuff like like uh, what he wrote late in his ministry on the Jews and their lies, his interpretation of what God's will was for the Jews has nothing to do with the Bible. I mean, you read Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, where it talks about how much Heavenly Father loves the physical descendants of Abraham and how he's not done with them. And they're all going to be grafted back in in the appropriate time. And that that it's only being high-minded and, and proud that would cause the Gentiles to look down on the Jews, that they should regard them with great reverence as those who gave them the foundation that they were grafted into that holy root. Well, Luther was like, well, forget that. <laughs> kill them all you know and and luther's writings about the jews became the foundation for the holocaust yeah. you know you if you went Wonderful. to Hitler's writings all of the ss people were walking around that was their handbook was on the jews and their lives because hitler i mean not hitler luther not luther just he just said they were they were so horrible that that we we are guilty for not slaying them all if and they don't the, convert, right? Yeah, if they don't convert, if they converted, which of course Hitler took it further. Even if you were uh, if you were a Jew and, and a Christian, no converting you'd still, you're a Jew off of your head. <laughs> yeah. So Hit, Hitler took Luther's writings and went further with them. Well, let's get back on the Christian path and get away from Hitler. I think I think it might be good to to take a second too and just summarize or briefly say about Calvinists because LDS we. We don't know Calvinist, but I, I've learned from you what that means, that basically they think only a certain amount will be saved, uh, 122,000. Right. They, they, right? they believe, they have this whole thing, The, the fund, it's called TULIP. Let's see, it's uh, total the total depravity of man, unconditional election, limited atonement. Uh, I can't remember what the last two are, but even limited atonement, they, they believe that Christ only died for the elect. He didn't die for all men. He only died for the elect and that that election is unconditional basically that god chose certain people to be saved and to become elect and those are the only people that jesus died for and if you're predestined to be elect essentially oh, yeah. there's no there's no free will if god yeah. predestined you to be elect you are going to come to faith in christ and you're going to become elect and you're going to be in heaven with him. And yeah, I ran else... into these people, yeah, before on my mission, I ran into some of these guys. And yeah, I said, well, surely who, who... people who are Calvinists. Well, let, let me don't finish. Let me finish. When you ask me a question, I know I'm long winded, but you have to let me complete my answer. Go ahead. Jump in. Because this last thing, they believe everybody else was specifically created by this God who is love for no other purpose than to be damned and tormented for all eternity. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm just speechless at, at the ignorance of that anybody would believe such a thing. But these people, they, they really believe this stuff and they are very proud. And anybody that doesn't believe like they do, as far as they're concerned, that's evidence that they're vessels created for destruction. They're not the elect. Yeah, you're not the elect if you don't if you don't buy into this garbage. But in in any case, I say all this just to say that I was looking. I I'm trying to sort through all this mess, and I have com come to the conclusion 
and had been carrying this conclusion for most of those first 11 years that we talked about in the last video, that the the real church had to be on the on the foundation of apostles and prophets, which Jesus is a chief cornerstone, that God appointed in the church, like it says in 1 Corinthians 12, apostles and prophets, and Jesus is the same yesterday and today, today and forever, and that when Christ gave gifts unto men, as it describes the fivefold ministry in Ephesians chapter 4, that he, he gave some to be apostles and some to be prophets until we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of Son of God, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So I knew, unless I found real apostles and prophets, all I was going to find all I was going to find was deception and confusion and nothing right. solid to stand on. And, and that scripture is so like, like on, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy ghost came down, the Holy ghost did not hand everybody a book. The gospel was proclaimed. The true plan of salvation was proclaimed. And those who were cut to the heart by the power of the atonement of Jesus Christ repented and were baptized for the remission of their sins. They received the gift of the Holy ghost. And it says, that day, 3,000 souls were added to them, verse 41 of chapter 2, and verse 42 says, and they continued daily in the apostles' teaching. They, they didn't just put Jesus in their pocket and go back to some other place. It, they were brought into a covenant people that was under the teaching of apostles and prophets. And so I, I knew all this, but I'm, I'm out there trying to find what to do next. And I contact this old gospel, this gospel outreach church I've been part of. And it turns out that Jim Durkin had appointed the man who was the head of the gospel outreach group in Olympia and three or four others as his successor apostles in gospel outreach. And this, this fellow in Olympia, he says, Oh, I'm going to be coming out there to Ohio. We're going to be having an Apostles and Prophets conference in Cleveland in three weeks. You should come up there. <laughs> and so I'm like, oh, God's heard my prayer. I, I can go to Cleveland, and there, there's going to be Apostles and Prophets there, and I can pick which one I want to follow. <laughs> I know this sounds absolutely wacky. I've but... heard this story before, too. Have you? Yeah, from, from you. From really? You, yeah. I've never told this story about what happened in Cleveland. Oh, but in I any case, I go to Cleveland and Jim Durkin, <laughs> Jim Durkin, the apostle of gospel outreach, is one of the one of the apostles in attendance. And then there's uh uh Larry Tomsek, who's who's one of the apostles of the People of Destiny International, which in a few years morphs into sovereign grace mm -hmm. churches. And there were a few other two others too. But I go there. And uh, it's an Apostles Prophets Conference. These people are apostles. And so I go there and I listen to Larry Tomsack and I'm like, wow, he seems, he seems, uh, yeah. But see, these are, these are individuals who are convinced they're apostles who are trying to gain a following. All right. They're individuals, you know, I, I should say though, See, Larry Tomsack, one of the things that drew me to Larry Tomsack was he was part of a duo. And this is very rare, an apostolic duo. Larry Tomsack and C.J. Mahaney, they were the two apostles of People of Destiny International. And they had trained and discipled some other men that, that they were beginning to, to call apostles with them, one of whom was a man by Ready the name of spreading out yeah one of the one of whom they're, they're spreading out yeah they're, well and one of them was named steve shank so here's a group that actually has what the latter-day saints actually have they appeared to have multiple apostles that were functioning together in unity and and to me this drew me like a magnet because i i knew it, it isn't supposed to be an individual thing and uh so in any case, I go back home and I'm like, I, I talk, I talk with uh, Larry Tomzak and Steve Shank, these two apostles from people of destiny, supposed apostles, false apostles from people of destiny international. And, and they are in the process 
of having Steve Shank be sent as an apostle to start a new People of Destiny church in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And uh, so I, I tell them what I'm doing. I've got this this church that I started called the Door Christian Fellowship, but I'm I'm burned out. I, I can't go on with it. I, I'm at the end of my rope. What should I do? And they say, well, you just need to just liquidate everything and just come down and help us be, be part of this church, this apostolic church plant in Virginia Beach, Virginia. So I do it. I go home. We, we, we shut everything down. Uh, there was a handful of people in my church that were very enthusiastic about <laughs> finding something more real. I mean, they'd found something that they appreciated with me, but I couldn't go on. And now I'm going to go be part of this church in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And they're like, can we go with you? I'm like, hey, whosoever will may come. You want to come with me? You want to move to Virginia Beach? I'm moving to Virginia. You want to move to Virginia Beach and we can be part of this church? It, it ended up being, initially it was called the Harbor, but then it was renamed Southside because it's on the south side of the Hampton Roads metro area. Did you take your family? Of course, of course. Okay. Yeah. I, are you are you feeling appropriately sorry for my wife yet? Yes. <laughs> of course you are. I I can see it. On <clears throat> you. Can you imagine being married to a character like me? That would be a I challenge, can't, really. And and see, this is <laughs> well. Let's hope not. Yeah. But see, I and I apologize if I if I'm laughing too much. Because this is heartbreaking stuff. But I I couldn't tell the story if I if I let myself feel the incredible pain of all this. And not just my I'm not talking about my pain. I'm talking about the pain, what I put other people through, what I put people through that got involved with my little church and uh I gave them hope that that was disappointed. I'm talking about, see the, my wife and I bless her heart. I am not saying this in any way to knock her, but she had a very different heart than mine in the sense that she loved, really loved uh, Latter-day Saint Christian, uh, not, she really loved Assemblies of God Christianity. She had been, she'd had a wonderful upbringing in the Assemblies of God. Her parents were just glorious, glorious people who loved Jesus. Her, her father, he, he was my father, he died at 105. I, I mean, when he retired at 65, he lived another 40 years and he was holding down a job into to his late 90s, you know? I mean, just, you know, he read through the Bible every single year. He and his wife, when they were in their 80s and 90s, would go and she would play gospel piano and he would play gospel saxophone. They were like a gospel duet uh, at the nursing homes like three times a week. I mean, these are just wonderful people. And Gloreen had had a wonderful upbringing in Assemblies of God Christianity and loved it. And her dream for our whole 23-year marriage was that her husband would finally stop being insane and settle down and just be willing to go to a really good Assemblies of God church and be happy. And th this, is, this was the impossible dream that she clung to for our entire marriage. But she's married to this wild man that I'd sit in Assemblies of God church and I'd be like, let me out of here. I mean, it turned my stomach. I mean, I I, I I don't want to overstate it. A lot of good people, they would have, uh, like we would go, I would go with her occasionally to Phoenix First Assembly of Church, uh, Church Phoenix First Assembly in Phoenix, Arizona, pastored by Tommy Barnett, who's one of the leading figures in, Latter in uh, Assemblies of God Christianity. And, you, you know, they'd have like a Christmas pageant and they'd have elephants and camels. And I, I mean, like in the church, <laughs> I mean, and you know, just cast of thousands and just incredible music. And th then he'd be up there and, he, and people, all these people that were non-religious or irreligious, they'd send out fleets of buses to bring these people in and they'd be there and they'd just be like affected. And then he'd be up there, you know, if, 
Do you know Jesus? You just lift your hand, say, pray for me. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Lift up your hand and say, pray for me, pastor. And, and then this is how he'd lead them in the sinner's prayer that nobody could even see who was lifting up their hand to pray with him. And, and they would silently agree with him praying the sinner's prayer up front. And, and then they were born again, man. Their, their names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And on one level, it was beautiful and stunning, but it wasn't real. You know what I mean? I mean, they weren't really being brought into the plan of salvation in any way, shape, or form. You wanted more. You wanted more. <laughs> it was, yeah. I, I was so discontented with this kind of stuff. I was like, to me, it was just a blot on, because I, I don't know how to express it. All, all I know was my wife was a wonderful woman, man, but I never should have... I can't say that though, because you know my children. It's it's like it's it's such a a weird thing, but she was she was such a good woman, and she put up with so much. But her heart, what she was content with, I could not be content with. And and really, she also loved just kind of normal middle class life, her normal uh, middle class. Uh, uh, what is it? Her normal middle class assemblies of God Christianity, and normal middle class life, and and what she was hoping for when she married me was a man she saw I'd be a good provider because my dad taught me how to work. I'm skilled in business. If I needed money, I could make money, and she saw that. She this he's going to be a good provider. He's a good man. He'll be a good father. She married me and did not realize she grabbed a tiger by the tail. <laughs> I mean, this is this is just the reality of it. And, and, um, so in any case, me, my family, me, my wife, my children, and this, this handful of people who essentially had kind of grabbed a hold of me as somebody who really cared about them, we all moved to Virginia Beach, Virginia, and started attending, uh, Steve Shank's church plant. And they had specifically gone to Virginia Beach because, Pat Robertson, are you familiar with Pat Robertson, the yeah. 700 Club, Virginia yeah. Beach, Virginia, and he started a Christian, an evangelical Christian mm -hmm. university, charismatic Christian university called Regent University. And, and so there's this huge uh, population in the part of Virginia Beach and Chesapeake that they moved to of Regent University students and employees and hangers on of Pat Robertson's evangelical charismatic religious empire. And he, they had decided to start a church plant there because they thought it would be fertile ground for what they were doing. And this brings up the whole, uh, what happens in, in these metro areas these middle-class, upper-middle-class metro areas where there's a lot of evangelical Christianity is you end up with very specific churches that cater to the, the middle-class Christians. They want a big church that has programs for their youth, that hopefully has a Christian school attached to it, has a beautiful facility. Some of these places will have bowling alleys. They'll have Christian bookstores. They'll have cafes. They'll have... They'll have uh, activities for every imagine for the older people, the middle aged people, the younger people, the children. There's just stuff going on literally every night of the week. It's it's like you know Christian Disneyland. Is this in the eighties? Is this in the eighties now? I I moved there in nineteen eighty seven eighty eight. Okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. And uh, and at this time, like one of the biggest churches, uh, what was the name of it? There was a big church there of of the Rock. Rock Church, Rock Church, and they became famous because they had, and this is a very big thing in these kind of ch churches, they have uh, the, the, the pastor and his wife, she's not just his wife, she's his co-pastor, or they're both, they're, they're both apostles, okay, and, and, uh, and they had started this March for Jesus thing that they, they'd managed to be the, the spearhead of this evangelical thing that brought a million Christians to Washington, D.C. to march on the Capitol to demand whatever they were demanding. But but they were just very active. And so you've got like half a dozen of these huge megachurches in this area. 
and Steve Shanks Southside Church moves in there, and and what they do, it it's like they're all competing for the middle class tithing Christian middle class tithing families, and so another church comes in and they're reshuffling the deck. You know, it's it's like you, you know within six months, I'd say there were probably eight hundred people coming to Steve Shanks Church, and I'd say probably ninety five percent of them were one from the, the, the they they got them to come to their church from these other churches that they were going to where for one reason or another they weren't completely satisfied so they tried the new church and they like the new church in town just just like restaurants a new restaurant comes in you've got your favorite restaurant okay now uh chuckarama has come to town and you've been going to the golden corral uh <laughs> For, for years, but chuck rama you hear some good things. You go, I got to try Chuck. You go try chuck rama and you're like, okay. Let me, let uh, me add a little, let me add. We got the something. crab legs every Friday. It's <laughs> chuck rama from now on. You know, you know I, I think most people already know this, but uh, in the LDS church, we don't pay uh, most of the leaders that are in the church. They do not get paid. Yeah. And in all of these other churches, the more people you get to come into the church, the more the ministers get paid. And yeah. that's filthy and, lucre or whatever you want to call it. And that's a, a big motivation for people to start a church and yeah. uh, people to uh, get these things going. And in my hometown of Wenatchee, we had a one of these start up and they lasted, I don't know, five years. And then the uh, money man took off with all of the money and the 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 pastor and his wife took off too, and uh, people lost a lot of things uh, through these things. But anyway, that's a little aspect that a lot of people may or may not know about uh, these other churches. So yeah, exactly. So anyway, I I start attending this church with my family. And well, is that the one that you were sent over there to to, to work for? Was the Steve Shanks one? Well, I wasn't, I wasn't sent. They just said, look, if you want to participate in what we're doing, we can't come to where you are. You have to come to where we are. So I went there, I liquidated everything. And then I took all this stuff. Like I had this, this is going to, you're going to laugh at this. I had like a six man spa that I used for a baptismal. Well, all that stuff, man, I loaded it up in a moving van. I took it down and I just donated it to, to Steve Shanks Southside church. And so I'm participating in this and, and see these kind of churches, they're very social. Uh, you, you know, they have what they call kinship groups where, where you gather in people's homes midweek and, you know, have popcorn and do, do spiritual stuff, maybe, it, you know, sing some songs, but mostly it's social. And, and then you have the, the Sunday services. You might have a Wednesday service or a men's Bible study one day a week, a women's Bible study one day a week. And and then as that that's just when a church is starting. And then when it grows and builds a facility, you add more and more services, more and more bells and whistles, because that helps you to attract in the competitive marketplace uh the tithing families. And and a successful mega church, it's it's not uncommon. The pastor, he he's not making like, you know, twenty thousand or fifty thousand or a hundred thousand a year. Some of these characters are pulling down, you know. 500,000, a million dollars. Uh, you know, some of them have private jets. I mean, it, it's just wacky. Hmm. But in any case, I'm here. And my passion, as you might have noticed since you started watching the channel a year ago, is I want to encourage the saints in a real way. I want to seek and save the lost. Like all these, all these poor people that are out there earnestly searching for the truth, but know not where to find it. I got to find those people because... That's what you do if you're the people of God. Is it, There's more joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. Like, if Trail Reeves gets baptized, I'm just going to be beside myself, man. I'm just going to be weeping the day that he gets baptized. I'll just be, I'll just be brokenhearted with joy, you know? And and so this, this is what's burning in my heart. I mean, I, a year, year and a half earlier, I had taken my entire, entire, you know, retirement program and all of my assets, my silver, my gold, my stocks, and I just like melted it all down and and spent it trying to seek and save the lost in this little town of Wintersville, Ohio. 
and almost killed myself trying to make a difference in the lives of a of a double handful of people. And I'm sitting in this church with 800 people, and the gospel's not being preached, and people are not coming to Christ. You're just reshuffling the deck of, of these families that are already Christian families. And and I'm just like, this is nuts. This isn't, this, I, what am I doing? What am, you know, I was just like, and then, then uh, a while after this, the big thing that drew me was you, these people of destiny, the sovereign grace churches, they have like a, a quorum of apostles and they're all together. Oh. Well, the, the big two, uh, Larry Tomzak and CJ, CJ Mahaney, uh, uh, essentially excommunicates Larry Tomzak because his, his son, his son's, uh, character you know at the age of 18 or 20 it doesn't measure up to cj mahaney's judgment and and so there's this huge split among the chief apostles of people of destiny and it, larry tomsack is just supposed to receive his discipline and wait till his son uh straightens up and and is given mercy by the the other leaders of people and cj and larry tomsack's like well forget that and he moves down to atlanta and starts his own as his as an independent apostle and starts his own church and his own own movement and his son becomes one of the pastors and i mean you're just talking about more of the same you know and i, I had i had liquidated everything and sold and, and moved to virginia beach virginia to be part of this this clown show um i mean i i don't know i don't want to use too harsh language because i want to say at the same time um people the, these people are not knowingly evil and malicious they're sincere people that love jesus and just like me they would see in the word of god the kind of things that are supposed to be happening in the kingdom of god on earth and they'd read the book and then try to do it but they don't have genuine apostolic or prophetic authority and they don't have real priesthood authority so they're just like me in the sense that i was trying to make something happen for god but did not have the authority to do it it was presumptuous of me and they're the same way i i, I shouldn't be throwing stones at them because they were the same way they're just better at it <laughs> oh. the thing that was missing was the uh the inspiration and the guidance from our heavenly father to someone who is uh put in position to lead and that's every time that they would read the bible i i asked one of these ministers i said where do you get your priesthood you know where is your priesthood come from and he said well i came it came from the bible i said well how did that happen he said well i just felt it and it and it just happened and I said, well, I have the Melchizedek priesthood, and you can go two or three steps back from the person that laid their hands on my head back to Peter, James, and John in Christ. So, uh, you know, that's where I got mine from. So um, it's, it's no wonder that there's so many different denominations and that you it was hard for you to find anything because it, uh, it just didn't exist you know to the it doesn't exist it. it doesn't exist outside of latter-day saint christianity right. yeah. and th there's all these apostles but a real apostle the the heart of our father and the reason why he sent his son is that in the dispensation of the fullness of times that all who are willing to be gathered would be gathered into one one lord one faith one baptism one god and father they apostles they proclaim the gospel they make disciples but they gather them into one and they don't do it individually and independently of one another. Like, like Paul, like what he was doing, he was one, like it talks about in Galatians chapter two, he went and he sub submitted himself to Peter, James, and John and said, this is the gospel I'm preaching. I'm, I'm telling you about this to, to find out whether, whether I'm running in vain, whether I'm on solid ground. And they said, look, you're on solid ground. You're called to go to the Gentiles. We're called to go to the Jews. Here's the right hand of fellowship. We're together on this. Do you know? 
or like when there's the controversy in Antioch in, in Acts 15 about how to understand the, the role of the law of Moses in the, in the lives of these new disciples. They didn't just figure it out independently. They went back and submitted it to an apostolic and prophetic council that was one. And all sorts of division, much dispute, but then the Holy Ghost speaks to them through Peter and James, and they all hear the same thing, even though naturally what they would want to hear is the exact opposite. And then they write a letter in complete unity. It seems good to the Holy Ghost and to us. And they hand it down. And then in Acts 16, 4, well, Paul and Barnabas, they go back, they they deliver to the, the believers in Antioch the decision, and everybody's like, oh, now we... We can be one again. We know what to believe. And then it says in Acts 16, 4, that uh, at that point, Paul and Barnabas, they said, we have to go back to all these churches we've established. And so they do. They go throughout all Asia Minor on their second missionary journey. And it says in Acts 16, 4, they went back and delivered to them the decrees for to keep, which had been determined by the apostles in Jerusalem, and therefore there was great peace, and the churches increased daily. I think and, I think we need to bring this to a close because yeah, we're way past where yeah. we thought, and we'll we can continue this. Yeah, in, you know, in uh, that, no, video. that's good. This is this yeah. is a good stopping point. Yeah, I I've given up on just to sum up. I give up on trying to run my own church there in Wintersville, the Door Christian Fellowship. I, I go, I hear about this Apostles and Prophets Conference in Cleveland. I go there. I settle on believing in, trusting the, the apostolic uh, claim and leadership of this group called the People of Destiny, which becomes Sovereign Grace Churches. Steve, uh, Steve Shank, C.J. Mahaney, Larry Tomczak. I liquidate everything with my family, sell my house. I mean, sell this house I had built and and move to Virginia Beach, Virginia and jump in with what they're doing there. And then just realize this is, this is not the kingdom of God on earth. What do I do now? Okay. And <laughs> this, this was, this was like the story of my life. I'd be like, okay, Maybe this person's an apostle, and I'd throw myself into believing in them and following them and get crushingly disappointed. And of course, all along, I mean, I'm disappointed in myself too, man. I'm responsible for this sweet wife and for these children and other people, friends that are kind of looking to me as an example. And and I'm just blowing it all over, you know, fooled again. Bought another pig in a poke. Here I am. Uh yeah, I once again looking for genuine spiritual authority in another wrong place, and so by now it's uh, I just decide I, I just can't be in the South Side Church anymore. I'm gonna have to just leave that church, and I don't know what to do next. And now it's like the, early nineties. This is 1990. So we, we only we only covered three years from 1987 to 1990. So if you want to know what comes next, you need to watch the next video. If you want to know what comes next, you need to watch the next video because it gets really interesting. Wait till I tell you about Mabel and the the hog roast <laughs> in. in Foundation Park in Chesapeake, Virginia. Mabel and the Hog Roast. That alone is worth the price of admission to listen to <laughs> another episode. And I'm not going to tell you about Mabel and the Hog Roast until the end of the episode. Well, I shouldn't have told you that because now you'll just fast forward. But <laughs> in, in any case, I mean, this is this is heartbreaking stuff. But I, I don't want anybody to. I don't want anybody to not know. I spent so many times just brokenhearted, just sobbing all over over this stuff. And so did Glorine. She's like, what? You know, and and of course, my children were all little and, and they were just, as long as they were with mom and dad, they, they didn't really care where we were at that point. But 
it's just heartbreaking when you try and make a difference in people's lives and all you have the power to do is to give them a hope that proves false and disappoints them. And of course, that's all I had to give people because that's all I could find. Hey, you that's know? fine. So with that said, let's say a prayer. Why don't you go ahead, Jim, and just uh, close us in prayer here? Okay, I can do that. Heavenly Father, we're thankful that we've been here today, that we've been able to go over uh, David's uh, stories to be able to find out his uh, desires to find the true church. We're thankful for your church. We're thankful for the apostles and prophets and, and our church today. And we're thankful for your spirit. Help us now to... Uh, have a good day and go forward and uh, hopefully in this next set of videos, we can uh, get to the things that he was able to find and conclude. And we say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Hooray. Amen. Well done.